Mr. Andrew, Revelation chapter 6. Well, you wait for instructions. Don't you move until you know what you're supposed to do. Even I don't know what we're supposed to do yet. <laughs> wait till Andrew makes it up. <laughs> Before you do. Revelation chapter 6 here this morning. We are in the action packed part of Revelation. There's going to be action every single passage that we. Uh, that we're in from here forward, we're going to see God working, God doing things very, very directly with man. And uh, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And uh, the reality of it is, is that is the time period that we see in Revelation chapter 6. We see God. We see God working. If you found chapter 6... Uh, I would like to begin this morning reading, and uh, actually, it wouldn't take very much for us to read uh, through the entire chapter. We won't do that this morning, but I want to just look down at, uh, let's see here, verse beginning at verse 12. And uh, this is John speaking. He's speaking of future events, and he said, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there's a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, this is verse 14, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And what's the answer to that question? No one. Father, please help us today to see the future, to see judgment, to see how fearful it is to come into a place of judgment with a God who first loved us and gave His Son for us. And I just ask that our proper response today would be reverence, compassion to the lost, and ultimately that our knowledge of the future would help us to be motivated to preach the gospel, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but this future event that we read about in Revelation is very, very graphic. Very graphic. And there are a lot of things that come up to it. We are in the portion of the Scripture where we see John and we see that he has seen that the book that is sealed up with seven seals. There were seven seals that were sealed up. Last week we saw that uh, it is very, very likely, I believe it is absolutely, uh, the same thing that Daniel saw, the prophecy that Daniel saw, uh, that was told, seal it up. The time is not yet for these things to come. If you want to reference these seals, you could go to Daniel chapter 12. We did that last week, and so we will not today, but if you're like me and sometimes you see a reference that explains a reference, sometimes in my margin of my Bible, I'll write something like Daniel chapter 12. By the way, uh, get a Bible you can write in. That's my personal recommendation for you. Most of us invest in certain things in life that are of value or of importance to us, and something every one of us ought to have is something we use every day, and that's a Bible. And so get a good Bible, my recommendation for you. And can I reckon, just recommend, I'm, there's, I'm not paid anything for, well, I should get paid something for now. <laughs> I'm not paid anything for this, but I have been greatly helped by a ministry up in uh, Michigan. It, let's see, what's the name of the city where it's in? It's, uh, I should know this. Charlie, what, what, what's the city where they print the Bibles at up there? What? How can you not remember? It's a small town, small church. What? No, it's not Saginaw. Uh, no, it's not Grand Rapids. 
it's a small church. It's not Howell. It's it's anyway small church in Michigan that they they print Bibles. Local church Bible publishers is the name of the ministry. Some years ago, they uh, were burdened or concerned with the reality that companies that were secular, that is, they're not Christian companies, are the ones that are printing all the Bibles and coming up with new translations of Bibles and printing them. And they thought, well, you know, if a person doesn't believe there's a God and they're handling God's Word and they're translating God's Word and that sort of thing, isn't that a little bit of a conflict or isn't that a little problem when the church is being sold a Bible from someone who doesn't even love the Lord? They're not going to be as careful or, or careful at all about preservation and they might tamper with it a little bit, don't you think? And so, uh, if a godless company is selling Bibles, they, there's a motive for it other than we just want people to know the Word of God, isn't there? I mean, that's just common sense. And so this church uh, was just burdened about saying, you know, the church ought to be the ones printing Bibles. And so at cost, they began uh, to develop very, very nice Bibles, nice text, leather-bound. Uh, I have never had, until I started buying these Bibles or having them bought for me, I, the first one I had was a gift to me, I've never had better quality leather than the Bibles that, that are made in this. You can't do this with your bonded leather or your um, uh, whatever, you know, your synthetic leather or whatever. You can do that with my Bible and in just a little while it'll be all ironed out and look nice. It, this one's ironed calfskin. And uh, so guess what a, a Bible like that would cost in a bookstore? About $300. A Bible that's, that's double bound and has uh, double ribbons and gold gilding and all that. It's about a $300 Bible in a bookstore. And I bought this one for about $60 shipped, maybe $65 shipped. The price on shipping has gone up just a little bit. But it's a wide letter, uh, high quality pages, and you can write in the margins. And so it's nice when you read something and you say, oh, you know, that's Daniel 12. Well, my memory's not always so good. Usually in the mornings, uh, I can remember things pretty well. But you ask me a question in the evening, and my answer will be like, oh, I know, but I, I can't remember, you know, about things. So I'll write things. And like in my Bible, Revelation 5, verse 1, I have Daniel 12, 4 written there. And it's a reference to the last days. This is a portion of, of Revelation. And that brings us back in this. But Local Church Bible Publishers is the name of the a, of a outfit. You can go online. And they sell Bibles for the cost that it... Uh, for the cost for them to print them. They have individuals actually working in the printing that are actually supported by uh, different ministries to do what they do. And so you're not even paying for the labor cost of printing the Bibles. And so that's really a bargain. I just want to just turn you on to that a little bit. It's hard to get a good quality Bible. They're in Milford, Ohio. What's it, Milford? Thank you, brother. You knew that, didn't you, Charlie? You didn't know that? Well, this... I said Michigan, didn't I? I'm thinking of that other great little church in Michigan. So I threw you off just a little bit to begin with. Yeah, Milford, Ohio. There is there is another church in Michigan that also prints. Uh, Lansing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, Lansing. There is one as well. So they large print too? Charles, you have your Bible? Can I borrow Charles your Bible for a minute? Charles has a large print. Can we pass your Bible around, brother? But this is not the message this morning. Have a look at that. Awesome. Have you ever seen anything like it in your life? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that nice? Yeah, no, it doesn't have margins. It would have to be considerably larger. But that's large print and uh, good quality. Thank you, Brother Charles, for being willing of that. <laughs> so, yes, they do. They, they, they have a number of different versions. They keep adding, not versions, but different editions of prints and so forth. And so I just want to recommend that to you. Again, nothing in it for me, nothing in it for them other than just to be a help to people that want a good quality Bible. And so, yours still smells like new leather, brother. That's, that thing, that, that's really nice. Revelation chapter 6, if you'll go back there again. Um, again, this is Daniel 12, the seven seals, seven seal judgments that are sealed up to the last day. And one of the things Daniel was told was that the time for them was not yet. We know that the specific prophecy that Daniel was given and that he was given to communicate was that the 70 years were 70 weeks. In other words, the decree that, that uh, the Jews could go back to Jerusalem happened after 70 years. But there was also a far fulfillment for the Jeremiah prophecy of 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And that far prophecy was 70 weeks. We don't use this as much, and maybe we should bring it back. We should revive the week or have a revive the week <laughs> campaign 
where we would uh, where we would uh, come to, to to have the vernacular in in our vocabulary and our usage uh, for seven. Seven's a good number, by the way. You know, it's a, it's a Baker's half dozen, <laughs> if you will. Uh, but we use the word dozen, don't we? This morning, the teenagers, we had two dozen donuts minus three, which disappeared uh, before. Not because of me. I did not make the donuts disappear. I know that's what you immediately thought. But we had two dozen Krispy Kreme donuts in Sunday school class. They had Dunkin' Donuts in the adult class. And they, were, and, uh, they had two dozen Dunkin' Donuts, too, this morning, didn't they? So a dozen is how many? A week is how much? Seven. So the 70 weeks in Daniel are 490 years, and Daniel was given to explain that there would be, before that final week in Daniel, that, that series of seven, that there would be uh, a time in between that where the Messiah is going to come, he'd be cut off not for his sins, but for the sins of the people. Now this is a long explanation, but that's how we know precisely that the, or that's how the wise men knew precisely that Jesus Christ had been born. They knew when Daniel was written. They knew when the 70-year captivity had ended. And they knew that at 493 years later, Jesus Christ would be born. So, 69 weeks. There's one week left before the restoration, uh, before the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the restoration of the temple. There's one week left. Or there's, there's one week left. And that's a week that is known in the church as, we call it, the Great Tribulation. And by the way, there's a difference between Tribulation and Great Tribulation. The difference between Tribulation and Great Tribulation would be, Tribulation would be hardship or persecution that an individual could go through and encounter, and it certainly we, we could, would not trivialize it. You can be persecuted, can you not? Aren't you glad for the man, the pastor that was released this past week yeah. and is back in the United States? I'm glad that we've got... Uh, that we've got a kind of a president that's concerned about religious freedom around the world is actually doing something to try to uh, try to, to to help with that. I'm, I'm so grateful. I heard him on the news this morning just saying how grateful he was for the members of Congress and for the president for uh, negotiating his release. But that man's been persecuted, and I promise you, he has. It, it were it not for the fact that he had citizenship and affiliation in the United States, he has peers that have been much more greatly persecuted. The apostles were persecuted, were they not? John alone survived without being killed out of, the, out of the apostles. Only John wasn't killed. Isn't that amazing? That's persecution, isn't it? But the difference between persecution and the Great Tribulation is, of course, the arm of persecution. That is that God is the one who is, who is causing the Great Tribulation. God is the instrument of judgment in the great persecution. I'll just tell you this. I'll take anything man can do to me. Just like, uh, like we're warned in the Scripture, not to fear one who is able to destroy the body, but fear the one who is able to destroy the body and the soul in hell. I, God helping me, am fairly fearless when it comes to what a man can do to me. Now, being an American citizen, men can do very little to me because of some rights that I have that I'm very thankful for. But the reality of it is that I don't live in fear of men. Why? Because I fear God. A person who fears God doesn't fear men. What we're seeing in this passage of Scripture is what the wicked have been daring God to do, what people who are wicked have been challenging God to do, and that is, God, if you're good, if you're righteous, if you're just, why don't you judge the wicked? Ever heard someone levy that accusation against God? If God is good, why has He not destroyed the wicked? I've had individuals say, I'm wicked, and if you're God, why don't you destroy me? And they have challenged and they have dared God. And my friend, a good judge judges evil. A good judge judges evil. Nothing would be more frustrating for you, and nothing is more frustrating when you seek justice and it's not delivered. Isn't that so? It's a terrible travesty uh, when something like murder or some type of abuse is committed and the judge won't judge it, won't deal with it. 
It's a brain. You ever call law enforcement for a crime and they've told you they don't, we don't bother ourselves with that? We don't care about that? You know what? That, that's oppression. It's oppressive when people can do evil and uh, there isn't any judgment for it. And if God's a good judge, He will judge. And this is the time. My friend, I want to remind you that today we live in the day or the age of God's grace and the age of God's long-suffering, the age of God's mercy. And we're, under, we're given to understand by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the reason that God has not erased or destroyed the world is because of His long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God's bent is to be merciful. God's desire, God's heart, is for the very ones whose sin is against Him, the very ones who are the most deserving of His judgment, should instead receive His mercy and His Son receive the judgment in, his, in our place. That's God's heart. And that's the age in which we live in. My friend, you and I can confidently declare the Gospel today knowing that God's will is that no one should perish but that all should come to repentance. We're living in the age of God's long-suffering. Don't get distracted by false, disingenuous arguments that try to set yourself up as merciful or yourself as just or yourself as kind or long-suffering when the reality is that you and I have not sacrificed anything to be reconciled to God, but God has sacrificed His Son in order for us to be reconciled to Him. God's merciful. And He's withholding judgment. And the day when God no longer withholds judgment is going to be a great and terrible day. And that's what we're beginning to see. These are the sealed judgments. These are the things that Daniel said, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to describe this. And God said, seal it up. The time isn't yet. But here we are, and we have the seals opened up. John is able to see, uh, because of the worthiness of the Lamb, the seven seals, and he is able to share with us what they were. Each of them we see as different individuals in different judgments. But the one that is... And by the way, I hope you've read chapter 6 up to our text this morning. I just can't preach everything that's in the text. It isn't possible. But in verse 9, we see that the fifth seal that's opened up... You know what a seal is, right? It's when a letter is sealed and there's a stamp on it that uh, has, uh, first of all, the signature of the one who sealed it, but also it also shows that it is not to be opened or unsealed by anyone other than the person to whom it is addressed. Ownership. Yeah, it's ownership. It's an ownership kind of a seal. That's a, that's a good word, good, good, uh, good aspect to it. Well, the seals are opened up because of the Lamb, Jesus, who is worthy. And now we see in verse 9, when He opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the Word of God and for the testimony which they held... And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now today, the outline in the message is one of those that follows the text. And so you see some points that aren't necessarily uh, parallel or they're not one point with expansions of the point. This is a point that stands alone. And the point here is that God doesn't forget anything. God doesn't forget anything. The saints, those individuals that have been martyred, who have been killed for the cause of Jesus Christ, they are not forgotten by God. Rather, they're under the throne of God in a place where they are constantly crying out and saying, how long until you judge the wicked? Oh, there are individuals who have been the recipients of great evil. And oftentimes we think God doesn't know or God doesn't care or God hasn't done anything. And the actual reality of it is, is that those individuals to whom great evil has been done are very, very near to God. And God knows about it. Listen, listen to me today. You may be a person who has been deeply wronged, deeply hurt. It may be that as a child something was done to you or as an adult someone did something to you and it seemed as though justice was not served, justice was not done. It may be that individuals, even in the name of God, covered something up. 
or did not deal with something, or did not believe you, or did not hear you. It may be uh, that someone who should have done right towards you did wrong towards you, and it may be that it is deeply scarred, deeply harmed, deeply hurt you, and you feel sometimes as though God Himself does not care. Can I say to you that you are very, very near to the heart of God? God cares about you. I just want to remind you of something that I'm oftentimes reminded of when I call out for justice. And that is those that will have justice will also be the recipients of it themselves. And if we were today to beg God to judge every person in this room or judge all the evil, uh, there wouldn't be a person in this room that escaped judgment. See, as much as you cry out for the things that someone has trespassed or committed against you, someone else perhaps could cry out against you. And there's a God in heaven who wants to judge His Son and to forgive transgressors. I did not say to overlook transgression. I did not say to leave a judgment undealt with. God judges every sin, every sin which has ever been committed is judged. And every person who has ever received mercy from God has not had God overlook their sin. They have had God place their sin on the cross of Jesus Christ and nail Him there as a sacrifice for the sin. Jesus paid for your sin, my friend. It was payment, not overlooking. It was because God paid for sin. And my friend, we have the kind of God who has levied against Jesus the judgment for everything that was ever done against you. But can I say to you, even more importantly, Jesus died for your sin. He died for your sin. He died for my sin. And my sin is the sin that ought to most concern me. There are these individuals who, for the cause of Christ, have been martyred, they've been killed, they have been unjustly treated. And the, John has this vision, this picture, not just a vision, but he has this revelation where the Lamb opens a seventh seal. And there John is able to see that under the altar these individuals are crying out, How long, O Lord, dost thou not judge and avenge them? In verse 11, the answer, white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their serf, fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And the answer is not all evil has been dealt with, and so not all judgment for evil. Uh, it's not time for the judgment to be made in full. You see that? There's still some more that's to happen. You say, Pastor, what if someone goes to the grave? And they've never gotten their comeuppance. They've never gotten what they've deserved for what they've done. My friend, no person's ever gone to the grave and there avoided God. Do you hear me this morning? A person may go to the grave having God be long-suffering and merciful to them. But my friend, they meet God. And when they meet God, they meet their judge. And there's no person who's done evil who's burning in hell unjudged. There's no person who's done evil who is living in heaven in the presence of God unjudged because Jesus was judged in their place. God is just. God judges sin. God judges all sin. And here then we see that there is more sin to be committed. And that's why God has not finally judged sin. We will see further on in the Revelation, when God finally judges sin, He's just going to judge everything. He's going to judge this sin-cursed earth. It's going to judge the planet. But now we see a phenomenon uh, that I can visualize in my mind's eye, but that it would be very, very hard to paint a picture of. I hope you're praying for the folks this last week that were uh, devastated by Hurricane Michael. What a devastating thing that is. Anyone who's ever been through that, and I have, I know it's what a tragi tragedy it can be. My heart was broken last week as I saw a lady being interviewed in her home with the roof torn off, and she was there while it happened, and just thinking of the sheer terror yeah. of what that poor lady went through, and, and then just the unanswered questions that so many people in the path of that storm have. What are we going to do now? And uh, it's really an overwhelming thing. We need to be in prayer for them. Having been in storms like that, I was in Hurricane Ivan and Hurricane... I, I was uh, Actually, while Hurricane Katrina was happening, uh, a friend of mine and I were uh, we were delivering for Bell South a, a large generator to one of the major storm stations for AT&T, or for Bell South in 
Gulfport, Mississippi. And the Gulfport actually had more of a direct hit than, than uh, New Orleans did. New Orleans had flooding that happened after the flood, or ha after the storm, but Gulfport, Gulfport was directly just pummeled. Everything from a mile from the beach and upward was gone. I mean, that's where a lot of Gulfport was built up, and it was just gone, just destroyed it. So I remember going in to that disaster situation, and I did have a camera, and uh, I took a couple of pictures, but the frustration of the pictures, because I had people say, let me know what's going on. I want to find out what's happening there. And I, the frustrating thing about taking a picture was you could see a picture, just whatever the camera could frame. But it just did no justice to the fact that there was a 180-mile-wide swath of absolute destruction. I could take a picture, you know, as far as the frame could see, but the devastation was so much grander, so much bigger than what the eye could see. And so in my mind's eye, I kind of see the panorama, more than just the panorama. I see, you know, the scope of the devastation. And literally in our text, we see the scope of the devastation is the heavens, the stars. You ever stand out at night or sit out at night, maybe lay on your back out in the country and just look up into the heavens and try to count the stars? I was watching a, a, a guy and his son making a video camping out. Uh, a week or two ago. And one of the things he told his little boys was, okay, uh, before you go to sleep, count the stars. <laughs> That's a pretty good way for a kid to fall asleep. You know, start counting the stars. How do you think that went? You know, <laughs> you, you can't even keep them compartmentalized enough to count them. And I know some of y'all count the you know dots on the ceiling tiles while I'm preaching and that sort of thing in here. So you know a little bit what it's like. But the reality of it is that the scope of the heavens... Every time someone discovers something about the heavens, what do they discover? That there are galaxies beyond our galaxy, that there are heavens beyond the heavens. The vastness of space. It, it is laughable. Was it Sputnik where they said, I don't see God when they went into outer space? Uh, the Russians said, uh, I think, now I'm trying to remember what it was. It was one of the Russians that said, you know, they went into outer space and said, I don't see God here. Well, my friend, the heavens are a little bit bigger than you getting outside of our atmosphere. They, God is rather large, rather vast. And uh, He's beyond the heavens. He's a God who created the heavens, and the heavens themselves declare His glory. That is, they show us a perspective of how vast God is. And now here we find in our text that the Bible says and after the sixth seal there was a great earthquake and the Bible says the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. You say, Pastor, the stars are larger than the earth. Yes, but something happens as they burn out and as they pass through the galaxy and the atmosphere. And I see here, you ever seen a burning, a shooting star or a star re-entering the earth's surface as it burns out and it plummets? Usually is dissolved before it even makes it to the earth. Literally, God is creating this heavenly storm where everything between Him and earth is literally cast down to the earth. And the stars, the Bible said, are uh, stars of heaven, verse 13, fall on the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. You ever have a fruit tree? Hey, hey teens, try, try to pay attention to the back row. It distracts me when you laugh, okay? Uh, when a fig tree, uh, or, or just, a, just a fruit tree, when, when the storm really gets it, seems like um, we have a loquat tree in our backyard. Anybody here know what loquats are? The little thing is kind of like a peach or whatever. They're, they're good. They taste good. But it just seems like a wind blows them off before they're ever, ever ripe. I tell my wife every year, if this year that fruit, that tree does not fruit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it down. I'm, to me... I, I, I have a little different philosophy about landscape than some of y'all. If you can't eat it, I don't know what its purpose is. And so, <laughs> I like fruit trees. And I've been frustrated by our loquats' lack of production. Now, it has some unfair circumstances, uh, like the, uh, oh, what's the big trees that flower, that have the tiny leaves and have the red flowers on them. The, uh, what? No, hibiscus or a bush. <laughs> What? No, that's a bush with thorns all over it. But those are pocophilias. That's what we call those. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. Anyway, I have one of those, and it's bigger than my tree. It's in the neighboring 
neighboring lot, and it overshadows my tree so it doesn't get as much sunshine as it needs in, in the dry season anyway. But it seems like every time that thing's about to fruit, we have a storm that comes in, blows hard, and then all the fruit's on the ground and it's not ripe enough to eat. And I've seen that happen with cherry trees and apple trees and peach trees and pear trees and that sort of thing. Storm comes through and blows them on the ground. The Bible says like an untimed, the stars come down. In other words, not because the universe has been destroyed. Here's a snippet. Here's a tidbit for you. You and I are supposed to be stewards of the earth. We're supposed to take good care of it. But my friend, this world is not going to be destroyed before God destroys it. We're not. The planet's not going to be destroyed before God does. There's going to be plenty left. It's going to be untimely destruction. There will be plenty left. So, if the folks that think that we have about maybe 30 sustainable years left are right about what they believe, we better take pretty seriously the reality of the coming of the Lord Jesus at any moment. It could be very, very soon. Now, uh, the fact is, is we don't know how long this earth would last before something collides or blows it up or whatever, but it's not going to happen that way. What's going to happen is God's going to destroy it. The heavens are going to be destroyed, and then they're going to be parted like a scroll. Just the way the scroll is opened up, the heavens are going to be ripped back. The Bible says the heaven... Verse 14, depart as a scroll when it's rolled together. So just like when you roll a scroll up, and uh, when you roll a scroll up, it will be rolled out of the way. And when it's out of the way, the Bible says every mountain and island were moved out of their places. God takes the earth and takes all the mountains and islands and just goes, jams it all together, moves them out of the way, just parts everything. And the Bible says in verse 15, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and hid in the rocks of the mountains. The point here of this description is how inclusive this judgment is. In other words, everyone who is left is left for judgment. And there's no exception. There isn't a way a person with money can buy his way out of this. There isn't a way a person who well, I'm just a servant, I'm not responsible for anything I do, uh, can be excused for this. Literally every person has the heavens open, and there is God. It's only a ridiculous notion that there's a mystery about these events. I get so frustrated when I hear individuals who are, quote, prophecy teachers who try to explain phenomenon, like natural phenomenon as God's judgment. It's nothing like that. When you see the heavens depart like a scroll, you see God on the throne. And there is left no doubt, no doubt, no unbelief, no lack of knowledge of who's doing this. Could God be doing this? Could God be causing the weather? Could the earthquake be caused by God? My friend, God does it. And there He is on the throne and they see Him. And they're not as terrified of the phenomenal events like the stars being cast down, like the heavens departing like a scroll, like the mountains being thrown down, the islands removed from the sea. Those events aren't what terrifies them. What terrifies them is that they see God on the throne. And He is holy. And He's high and lifted up. And you may have a rebel who ought to fear God, who in his rebellion will not bow before God. And so he crawls into the caves under the rocks and begs the rocks instead to fall upon him. I'm surprised at the audacity of rebellion. Aren't you? Friend, there isn't a lot more in this text that God wants us to see. Here's what God wants us to see. It's better to bow to your knees and worship God than it is to crawl in a cave and just say, God, just kill me. But that's the extent of rebellion. Every time I begin to study this portion of Revelation, I see how rebellious the heart of man is. How great God is, how merciful God is, how right God is to judge. 
how feeble man is, and yet how proud, even as worms, we can be. And I find it greatly astonishing that rather than worshiping God, individuals instead flee from Him and beg for the rocks to kill them. In other words, I'd rather die than bow. I'd rather die than bow. But actually, it isn't so astonishing. Because today the heavens do declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. Day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night showeth forth knowledge. People know there's a God. They know the nature of God, the Godhead, as we're told in Romans 1. And yet they say, I don't see God. God shouldn't be this way. God shouldn't be that way. They have all kinds of things as a worm, as lowly man to say about what God ought to be. But God is just as He ought to be, my friend. He's God. He is the Creator. We are the created. He is holy. We're all unholy. And again we see the juxtaposition, the opposition of what the opposites of what things ought to be and what they actually are. It's amazing that a man could shake his fist at God, isn't it? A fist that God made. And say, God, if you're real, why haven't you judged me? And God looks at him like an adult would look at a defiant child. <coughs> We're no match. I want to be merciful to you. And that's where I'm left today because it's still not that day yet. That day is yet to come. And today God is just simply saying, I've, I've stretched out my hands. I want you to come to me. I want you to, I just want you to repent and to receive the sacrifice that I've made on the cross for you. I want, I want you to receive forgiveness. I want you to be recipients of my mercy. I want you to be my children. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to be your friend. I want to answer your prayers. I want to be your God. That's the day which we live in, my friend. And oh, are we privileged. There has never been a more privileged era than the church era, the church age. When God is working through His church, and He is working His plan, which is to redeem as many people as will receive His mercy to Him. And I'm just reminded that at this day will not always be. These individuals who are now seeing this perspective of God have had the chance. They were alive in the church age. They could have already repented. They could have been caught up with the Lord Jesus in the air. But they're here and they are terrorized, they are terrified by God. The difference between the great tribulation, as we said in the beginning, and persecution or tribulation at the hand of man, is the hand. The hand of God, my friend, will be terrible in tribulation. One last thought. God does not judge the righteous. These are not godly men that are hiding in the rocks and saying, fall on us. Because we want to flee from the presence of God. These are individuals who cannot escape the presence of God. And His presence is wrath. And rather than bow, some will in the future, we'll see in Revelation. But rather than bow to God, they simply say, you're going to have to kill us. And as I see this, my final thought is that I don't like similarities in myself and these individuals. You know, sometimes we think defiance is noble, but there are circumstances where defiance is not only ignoble, it is foolishness. It's arrogance. And I don't see anything likable about these worms who will not bow to a loving God. 
who has now forced to judge them in his wrath. They would not bow to a loving God. And now they forced him to judge them in his wrath. Do you see any of those same characteristics in yourself? You might be here this morning and it might be that you've heard about the birth of Jesus Christ, His coming. As prophesied in the Scripture, specifically to the day in which He was born. And the fact that Jesus didn't come to judge the world, He came to die for sin. He died on the cross and He never sinned, so He died for your sin. <coughs> and yet your response is, I don't need a Savior. I shouldn't have to go to God this way. I should be able to come to God my way. The good things that I've done ought to be what God looks at. He ought not look at the sin which I've committed against Him. My friend, Jesus died for your sin. And there's no difference between a person who will not receive Christ and these individuals who are shaking their fist at heaven and saying, kill me first, I'll never bow. You know, I don't like that when I see it in me. And you ought to like it when you see it in you. We have a rebel in us, don't we? Amen. We have a rebel in us. And friend, we ought not like it. We ought to say, I had rather bow. Because God's always right. And if I am against Him, I'm always wrong. And it's good for us to acknowledge that. It's good for us to say, God, You're always good. You're always right. And God, when I don't agree with You, I'm always evil. And I'm always wrong first place, the first time that happens is when you acknowledge your sin. You know everyone knows you're a sinner. And if you haven't acknowledged it, you're the only one that believes you're not. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can play the games that you wish, but you'll find people that know you're a sinner, even if you won't be honest about it yourself. God's right. You don't think you're a sinner, you're wrong. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. If God is good, and He is, then He must judge the wicked. And if you're a sinner, you're the wicked. But the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you've not received Jesus, my friend, you're more foolish than these individuals that see the sky opened up and they see God sitting on His holy throne and in His righteous anger ready to judge them and they say, go ahead and kill me. My friend, what is God to do when you put Him in that situation? where you will not receive His mercy and you demand His judgment. What is a good, just God to do when you will not receive His mercy and you demand His judgment? Oh, how foolish the rebel is. How foolish. So the first place you and I deal with it is when we bow. When we come to the cross of Jesus Christ, which is the place where God makes sinners saints because of the position of Jesus Christ. And you know, that's as simple as just an acknowledgement. God, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sin. I want, I want to receive the free gift of eternal life. That's how simple it is. Yeah. The Holy Spirit of God will come in just simply for that acknowledgement. I'm a sinner. Jesus died for my sin. And I want the free gift. And just like that, you're God's child. And you're not the rebel. You may be a saint. That one day will be under the throne that God will avenge but you'll never be God's enemy at that point. Sometimes in the believer's life, sometimes we have an affinity for sin or we uh, are willing to even believe a lie against God, that the circumstances of life mean that God is unjust or unfair and that uh, we oughtn't to have to live His way or live our lives for Him. And there's a similarity in our rebellion to that same similarity that shakes its fist and dares God. I've heard Christians say, well, you know what? God's going to have to judge me. He may be right to do so, but that's the only way that I'm going to bow. I just, I'm just not going to change. I'm not going to do what God says. And my friend, you're very similar. Hey, you may be covered by the blood, but there's something wrong in your thinking. You're backward. And your best thing you could ever do is to say, God, where I disagree with you, I'm wrong, and so I'll bow. And the moment you bow, 1 John 1, nine comes into effect. 1 John 1, nine comes into effect. It's a wonderful, wonderful promise in the Scripture that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. That's God. That's His character. That's His... That's His he wants fellowship with us. 
And all you have to do to come into fellowship is to bow. I think it would be appropriate to end our service today, not with a come forward invitation like we oftentimes do, but maybe a remain where you are invitation so that we could deal with God. Let's take a moment and let's bow. I think it would be appropriate this morning for us, if you're physically able to, to go ahead and take a moment and, and rightfully worship God because of His holiness. And you can do so, you're free to do so. Feel free to move and to, uh, if you're physically able to, to go to your knees and bow before God. If you're not physically able to do so, God knows your heart and He knows you can bow before Him. It might be that this morning you want to be a recipient of His mercy and His grace and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior. And my friend, that's what you ought to do. It might be this morning that there's a part of your life where you're not willing to acknowledge that God is good and that He's just and He's right. And it'd be right for you to bow before Him. And let's just take a minute and let's finish our service by bowing. Because, friend, I do not want to identify with individuals that hide or shake their fist at God. I want to be one who bows.